Welcome back to Biomechanics. Unlike bone and teeth, other solid tissues are soft. They can undergo large deformations without failing. Soft tissues with obvious mechanical functions include skin and blood vessels, ligaments and tendons, pericardium and heart valves, muscle and heart muscle or myocardium. Other soft tissues include stomach and intestines, esophagus, kidney, liver and brain. We will consider the properties of soft tissues in the following categories. Their biological properties, their structural properties, and their mechanical properties, which we will further classify as either elastic or anelastic. Key biological properties of soft tissues include that they are dynamic. They grow, remodel, and adapt. They can heal after injury the cells change by hypertrophy, proliferation, necrosis, and apoptosis, and the cells can often contract or move. Soft tissues are also compartmentalized. They have important intracellular structures and organelles. They are comprised of cell matrix units, and they maintain an electrochemical balance. Finally, soft tissues are responsive and sensitive to their environment. They have regulatory mechanisms mediated by signal transduction pathways that enable them to maintain homeostasis. Important structural properties of soft tissues include that they are complex composites consisting of cells and basic functional units, extracellular matrix, vasculature, and lymphatics. They are highly hydrated, being 65 to 85 percent water, and the water content is well regulated and maintained between intracellular, interstitial, vascular, and lymphatic compartments. They have an organized hierarchical microstructure, irregular three-dimensional geometry, and in general, because of these things, they are difficult to test. Many of the mechanical properties of soft tissues can be described and modeled within the framework of elasticity theory. They include the fact that they undergo large, finite deformations. They have nonlinear stress-strain relations. They are anisotropic, with different properties when tested along different structural axes. They are inhomogeneous, with properties that vary from place to place in the tissue. And the mechanical properties are determined by the microstructure of the material. However, soft tissues also characteristically display a number of mechanical properties that are not consistent with the assumption of elasticity. These include hysteresis, which results in energy dissipation during loading and unloading. Creep, which is a time-dependent increase in strain following a step increase in stress. Stress relaxation, which is a time-dependent decay in stress following a step increase in strain. Soft tissues also exhibit strain rate dependence, but this effect is relatively small for the usual physiological range of strain rates. Viscoelasticity is the theory in which stress depends on this time history of strain with a fading memory. This theory is sufficient to model all of these properties above, hysteresis creep, stress relaxation, and strain rate dependence. Preconditioning is an important property of soft tissues that is influenced partly by strain softening, in which stress depends on the history of maximum previous strain. In spite of all of these anelastic properties, it is still common to approximate soft tissues as elastic. The pseudo-elasticity concept is the rationale argued by Y.C. Fung that provides the justification for this simplification. So let's start with the elastic properties of tissues. It's easy to find examples of physiological strains in almost all soft tissues that are too large to be accurately approximated using the Cauchy infinitesimal strain tensor. For example, during deep breathing, lung tissue may strain by 100%, and the heart wall can thicken by 50% during systole. The mesentery, which is formed by the double fold of the peritoneum that attaches the intestines to the wall of the abdomen, can stretch up to 200%. And the ureter, arteries, veins, and skin all undergo strains up to 50% or more. Collagenous connective tissues such as tendons and ligaments are stiffer but still strain by up to 2 to 10% under physiological loads. 
While it can be reasonable to approximate soft tissues as elastic, it is almost never a good approximation to treat them as linearly elastic. Not only do they undergo large deformations, but the stress-strain relation is typically very non-linear. For many soft tissues, the tangent modulus or slope of the stress-strain curve increases in proportion to the stress as seen here in this example of resting rabbit cardiac muscle. So tangent modulus linearly proportional to the stress. This observation that the tangent modulus is linearly proportional to the stress means that the slope here dt d lambda can be written as a linear function of the stress. To integrate this first order ordinary differential equation we need a boundary condition to solve for the constant of integration. Let's assume then that at one particular known stretch ratio, lambda star, the stress is T star. The typical condition that would be applied here is that la when lambda star is one, namely when there is no strain, that T is zero. But we could use any known point on the stress-strain curve to integrate this relation. Integrating, we see of course that T plus B must be an exponential with exponent a, an unknown coefficient c, that we can solve for using our boundary condition. t star plus b therefore equals c e to the a lambda star, which we can then rearrange to find c equals t star plus b times e to the minus a lambda star. Plugging this back into our general solution, we get that t equals t star plus b times e to the a lambda minus lambda star. And for the simplest case, when t star is 0 for lambda star is 1, this reduces to t equals b times e to the a lambda minus 1 minus 1. And we can check easily here to see that when lambda equals 1, t is equal to 0. So the observation that the tangent modulus here, the derivative of the stress with respect to the stretch ratio is proportional to the stress, leads us to the result that the stress-strain relationship is exponential. And this exponential stress-strain relation works well for many tissues, including cardiac muscle, skin, and ureter, but not all tissues. For example, ascending aorta is not well described by a single exponential function. Another relation that works well for some tissues is the power law approximation. For example, in the cornea of the eye, plotting the log of the stress versus the log of the strain gives a linear relationship suggesting a power law of the form t equals alpha e to the beta. Here we have an extra coefficient e s. Measuring these coefficients alpha and beta in cornea under uniaxial tension, we see that beta, the power for three different species, is very close to two, suggesting that a quadratic stress strain curve is a good approximation for the cornea. Unfortunately, many tissues require much higher powers uh, to get a good fit to the stress strain relation, making this formulation less attractive in those cases. Another important property of soft tissues is anisotropy. Ligaments, tendons, and muscles are fibrous with greater strength and stiffness along their axes. Blood vessels, on the other hand, are orthotropic, like bone, where the properties differ axially, radially, and circumferentially. Anisotropy necessitates simultaneous multiaxial loading, such as biaxial testing. This is different from bone, where we were able to simply perform separate uniaxial tests along separate structural axes. In soft tissues, this is not enough because there are typically nonlinear interactions between the stress and strain in different directions. For example, if an artery is loaded longitudinally, the circumferential stress strain curve changes. And conversely, if the artery is loaded circumferentially, for example, it's inflated, then the longitudinal stress strain curve is affected. So therefore, we need multi-axial tests where we simultaneously change the strain in multiple directions. This is an example on the left of a biaxial test rig designed by YC Fung and Gene Mead here at UC San Diego. 
The sample is the middle, connected by long sutures to motorized carriages that include force transducers at the end of each suture. Opposing carriages displace in opposite directions, moving in or out together, to keep the specimen in the middle so that the marks labeled on the specimen will stay in the field of view of the camera looking down on the sample that's being used to measure the strain. Here on the right, we see the results of so-called strip biaxial tests on a skin sample. Note that the tissue stress starts to rise steeply at a much lower stretch ratio when the tissue is loaded in the cross-body direction, the Y direction, while in the caudal cranial long direction of the body, the stretch ratio is held one, so the strain is zero, compared with when the tissue is stretched along the cranial caudal axis while holding the crossbody strain fixed. Inhomogeneity means that the properties are not spatially constant. They vary from place to place. This is common in biomechanics. For example, blood vessels have three separate layers through their thickness, the intima, the media, and the adventitia, which all have different mechanical properties. The thin intima consists of a monolayer of endothelial cells that make a negligible contribution to tissue stiffness, but have important biological functions, including regulating the vascular smooth muscle contraction. The media is rich in smooth muscle cells and can thus contract and relax dynamically. The adventitia is rich in connective tissue and provides passive stiffness and protection against excess strain. Blood vessel properties also vary considerably along the vascular tree. The ascending aorta has a relatively high concentration of elastin compared with the descending aorta, and the smaller arteries and arterioles have a higher fraction of smooth muscle. Hysteresis is seen here in a sample of human vena cava. This is not very much hysteresis compared with some tissues. However, you can see the difference between loading and unloading. The down curve is always below the up curve, and thus the area of the loop represents the energy dissipated as heat during the loading and unloading cycle. This means that the loading and unloading cycle was not thermodynamically reversible, so hysteresis is an anelastic property. Hysteresis is a property of viscoelastic materials, but most viscoelastic models do not very well approximate the hysteresis of soft tissues, suggesting that other anelastic properties such as strain softening may also contribute to hysteresis in soft tissues. Hysteresis varies considerably between tissues. It is low in ligaments, tendons, and veins as seen here, but high in cartilage and smooth muscle tissues such as intestines and arterioles, but lower in elastin-rich tissues such as aorta. Here we see the creep response in a cardiac muscle tissue preparation where the time after the step in stress is on a log scale on the x-axis and the strain is on the y-axis. You see that in the first six seconds the tissue strained by about 4%. By one minute the strain was 8% and by two hours it was up to 16%. This change in strain is all happening while the stress acting on the tissue is constant. Stress relaxation is a similar experiment where now the strain is constant and the stress is measured over time. In this example of a bovine coronary artery, the stress increased instantaneously when the strain was increased to over 200 kilopascals, but then immediately the stress starts to decay even though the strain was not changing. After this initial fast decay in the first 10-20 seconds, the stress continues to decay more slowly for the next 20 to 30 minutes. Creep and relaxation are both viscoelastic properties. In fact, measuring the creep and relaxation responses for a variety of different stress or strain step magnitudes is sufficient to characterize the viscoelastic properties of a material. Strain rate dependence is another viscoelastic property of materials. Here we see resting rabbit heart muscle loaded and unloaded at three different strain rates. Here the axes are switched from the normal convention with the vertical axis showing the stretch ratio and the horizontal axis showing the load. Note that the stiffest and smallest loop 
this one here, is the one with the fastest strain rate of 9% per second. When the cycle is slowed down by tenfold and a hundredfold, the curves are less stiff and the loops are bigger, but the differences between these three loops are rather small given the hundredfold change in strain rates in this experiment. Therefore, stock tissues are similar to bone in this respect. They do exhibit strain rate dependence, but the strain rate dependence is not very high over physiological ranges of strain rate. Since the properties of soft tissues are only weakly dependent on strain rate, we can approximate the response to loading and unloading using two separate stress-strain relations that are assumed to be independent of strain rate. Since most tissues undergo cyclic or continuously changing loads rather than a step change, we often do not need to be concerned with the creep and relaxation response that could take seconds, minutes, or hours. Thus, Y.C. Fung argued that we can approximate the viscoelastic hysteresis behavior of soft tissues with the more tractable framework of elasticity, provided that we are willing to allow that the elastic properties might have to be different for loading and unloading. This reasoning is known as the pseudo-elasticity concept and is a major reason why the anelastic properties of soft tissues are often ignored and the simplification of elasticity is commonly assumed for soft elastic tissues. Preconditioning behavior is a property of all soft tissues that is very important for anyone who's doing tissue testing. This is the property in where the stress-strain curve changes from the first to the second and subsequent repetitions of the loading and unloading cycle. Eventually, after about three to 20 repetitions, the cycle becomes reproducible and the tissue is said to be preconditioned. The testing system itself can sometimes contribute to the preconditioning behavior. The preconditioned state is often regarded as the most representative of the in vivo or homeostatic state of the tissue. Strain softening or the Mullins effect contributes to preconditioning behavior. It's a property of many elastomers in which the material is stiffer during the first loading to a new maximum strain than during subsequent loading to that strain. This is something that you see when you inflate a rubber balloon for the first time. It's harder to inflate the first time than during subsequent inflations. Here, in a test of jejunum from the small intestine of a guinea pig, when the maximum pressure was increased from 3 to 6 to 9 to 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury, the preconditioned pressure volume loop became softer and more compliant. Emery and Gregerson demonstrated that this is a major contributor to preconditioning in the passive heart and the small intestine. In other words, the difference between the first cycle and the second was much bigger than the difference between the second and subsequent cycles. Strain softening is usually thought of as some form of damage in materials like rubber for which it is fully irreversible. But strain softening in tissues tends to reverse after enough time. It may be associated with breakage or scission of intermolecular crosslinks that biochemically reform. Strain softening is not a viscoelastic property which is determined by the time history of strain. Strain softening is determined by the maximum previous history of strain. Here the y-axis represents the amount of softening that occurred in the previous experiment in the guinea pig jejunum, plotted against the time history of the loading, and you can see there's only a weak correlation. But when the softening is plotted against the maximum previous strain or volume experienced by the preparation, you can see there's a much stronger correlation, suggesting that strain softening is determined by the history of maximum previous strain, not the time history of the strain. So in summary, soft tissues are structurally complex hydrated composites of cells and extracellular matrices. Their characteristic mechanical properties include finite deformations, nonlinearity, anisotropy, inhomogeneity. They have viscoelastic properties including creep, stress relaxation, and hysteresis, and other anelastic properties such as strain softening. However, finite deformations, nonlinearity, anisotropy, and inhomogeneity can all be handled within the framework of elasticity. Because soft tissues exhibit load history de dependent behavior, mechanical tests must be repeated until the tissue is preconditioned. 
and Fung's pseudo-elasticity concept provides a rationale for why elasticity can nonetheless be a useful approximation for soft tissues in many situations in spite of their anelastic properties.